Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the ISD uh, Institute Colloquium. So uh, I'll, I'll slowly, we still have attendees, not attendee numbers increasing, but I'll slowly get going with the introduction. Um, so today we have Markus Arndt joining us from University of Vienna. Um, so let, let me quickly do a, uh, formal introduction and then perhaps a, a few less formal things. Um, so, Marcus Arndt started his PhD uh, in 1991 and completed in 1994 at uh, LMU Munich at MPK Garsching. Uh, his, his PhD what was with uh, Weiss and Hensch. Uh, after a brief, brief postdoc stay following that, he uh, started a postdoc at ENS with uh, Jean, Jean Dalibard, uh, then another postdoc at University of Innsbruck with Anton Zeilinger followed, and then he started climbing the ladders to a full professorship, and since he has been a full professor at University of Vienna. Um, so his, his CV is, th th there are many impressive things, impressive items in his CV, but I just want to give, give you a couple of them. Uh, just just a, a couple of recent professional activities. He has been the uh, speaker of the Urban Schrodinger Center for Quantum Science and Technology in Austria since 2016. And uh, recently he has been the v vice dean of the Faculty of Physics in University of Vienna. He has a number of um, interesting prizes that we would all like to get, including uh, the Wittgenstein Prize and ERC Advanced Grant in 2012, and more recently, um, a Fetzer Pioneer Award in 2018 and a Robert Wichard Paul Prize from the German Physical Society in 2019. So uh, let, let me tell you a, a, few, a few informal things about Marcus. So I, I, I've known Marcus for very long, I think 2000 four or six. So I was a PhD student in US back then. And um, I happened to visit uh, Vienna and gave a talk uh, at University of Vienna doing uh, concerning the research I was doing back then. And he actually miss, missed my talk. Um, but then he was actually interested in listening to what I had to say. So I sat down in the kitchen in, in University of Vienna and gave him the pretty much the gist of the talk in 15 minutes. So I was very excited and happy that actually was interested in my talk back then. Um, so since then I have run into Marcus at many occasions, but um, we, uh, and I, I hope to collaborate with him more in the future. Uh, just let, let me conclude this by telling you one, one more thing that some, something informal that you don't necessarily always hear. So I was uh, a member of the thesis committee of one of his, uh, PhD students recently, uh, Jakob Fein, um, and he, he wrote in his PhD thesis something very nice about him, so let me read that to you very quickly. So uh, the paragraph goes on and it says, uh, as well as his near constant accessibility and rapid feedback are deeply appreciated. A good scientist is not necessarily a good mentor, and I am lucky to have found both in Marcus. So that's that's a very nice thing to write, actually, so I thought I would, I would share that. So... Without further ado, let me give the microphone to Marcus. Thank you very much, Oliver. <clears throat> uh, I hope you can see the slides. Yes, yeah? slides are okay. looking fine. Okay. okay. Uh, of course, I had hoped to see ISC at that occasion, uh, but Corona didn't allow. So I'm happy to be with you now remotely. And um, I want to share a little bit uh, what we're interested in scientifically, our research on metawave interferometry which is a growing field, um, and uh, much of that is typically also in atom interferometry, and uh, there's a lot of contact, actually, direct, indirect, also with owner, also future projects just starting. <laughs> but um, what, what I will present today is um, molecule, cluster, nanoparticle interferometry, and nanoparticle not yet interferometry, but on the way towards, and uh, why we do that and how we do that. 
And um, of course, I always have to start with, <clears throat> um, let me see if my mouse does that. Um, just introducing the team. Of course, the team is changing all the time. Um, that's normal in science. Um, that's a picture of 2019. Um, and the names of these people are written on the top. On the left, there's a number of PhDs um, that have been in, in my group and that have moved on. Uh, collaboration partners uh, of recent years on the bottom. Uh, I, I will not read and uh, tell the story of everybody here because it's too many, but um, we really rely on excellent people and there are many of them. <clears throat> so, um, if the topic is universal metawaves, then we probably have to first look into what metawaves really are. And um, well, this is a kind of colloquium which is a bit more general. And that's why I also start a bit more general. Of course, I cannot do entirely without some specificities in the end, but uh, let's try to start relatively general. <clears throat> um, the wave nature of all matter, that is what we are interested in. And it has a long history. As several of you may know, quantum mechanics kind of started in uh, 1900 um, with the idea proposed by Max Planck that um, light should come in little quanta in energy packages um, where the en energy of each individual photon would be proportional to Planck's um, quantum of action and, and the frequency. And <clears throat> so this little three letter formula, I always tell my students you should memorize three letter, up to five letter equations. Um, more is usually too complicated, but five, five letters in the equation you can memorize. And these three you should certainly remember. E equals H nu. That's what energy stands for in the photon. But then you also may remember that's one of the most famous equations, uh, probably painted to many walls, um, that Albert Einstein proposed in 1905, that E equals mc squared. That energy is also related to mass and uh, the speed of light squared. So mass and energy are equivalent, but at the same time, energy and some oscillatory phenomenon, they are also equivalent. So that kind of inspired um, Louis de Broglie during his PhD thesis in 1923 to just propose there was no experimental indication that there should be an oscillatory phenomenon in face with a wave associated with all pieces of matter. And that's kind of a bold claim. And um, also when I give talks in high schools, I sometimes say, well, it doesn't need super formal mathematics. Of course, at some point, you also need that. But in many cases, it just needs the boldness and the idea. And here it's two equations combined in a slightly different way than you would naively think. It's not just H nu equals mc squared. Uh, he actually used a little bit of special relativity, um, including uh, Lorentz transformations and things like that. Unnecessarily, it turned out to be, but anyway. Um, but it was a relatively simple idea, just these two different concepts that energy is related to an oscillatory phenomenon and that mass is related to energy that made him propose that every piece of mass should be related to some oscillatory phenomenon. And he was very proud of that. When he, when he put that forward, he was very proud and he said, well, this is going to solve all the problems brought about, uh, about by quanta. And uh, there were not so many problems yet. <laughs> there was just the understanding of the atom and a Bohr's model of how the electron, well, as they believed, was circulating around the, the atom. And uh, things were not understood in there. And, and he seems to, to have been convinced that he could solve that. And he, he actually could. It was mistaken in other respects. But um, actually, most of the problems that we're discussing today were only brought up by, by his wave. Because the question is, what is this matter wave? How do we have to interpret it? What, what kind of consequences does that have? Now, um, how can we imagine a matter wave? I, I first present you briefly a water wave, which is not a matter wave, a water wave. And a, a water wave, well, what is the correct characteristic phenomenon or a telltale sign? Um, oh, here this is not moving, huh? That, should, that, that little film was moving a while ago, a minute ago, but it doesn't now. Wait a second. Uh, oh, not sure that I can get that started again. Um, no, doesn't matter. But you see the idea. Um, 
The idea is that uh, if you send a plane wave, um, water wave from the left-hand side onto this kind of double opening in the wall, then there will be secondary wavelets coming out on the right-hand side. And, um, well, if you make these slits very tiny, then they will look spherical or cylindrical in this case, and um, they will start to overlap. And wherever they overlap, they can either um, do that constructively when the when the troughs in the see, see troughs in the valley see that and, and the peaks see, see peaks, or they can do it destructively uh, when they're out of phase by 180 degrees. And as a result of that, in this particular picture, you would see um, higher wave excitation here in the middle and to the sides, and you would, you would find positions where there's hardly any wave excitation because of this destructive interference. So that is a very characteristic water, uh, not water, sorry, wave phenomenon. And um, what we are looking for in the other experiments now is kind of interference of that time. And the big difference now is um, that we also do that with individual particles. And people have started doing this um, right after De Broglie's thesis in 1923. Um, the, the first electron diffraction was seen in 1927. Um, neutron diffraction very shortly after the discovery of the neutron in 1936. But even for individual atoms like helium and small molecules like the hydrogen dimer, already in 1930 by Esterman and Stern, they saw these wave phenomena for individual atoms. What that really means, I will share with you in a minute. And then it was a long, long silence um, until the mid 80s, beginning of the 90s when and uh, the group of Dave Pritchard, Steve Tuma, Kasevich, Christian Bourdais, when, when they started seeing first atom and molecule interference again. <clears throat> and um, uh, Mark Kasevich and Stanford, that's the group where Honor was also been working. And there's a lot of famous interference experiments coming from these places. And <clears throat> that was a growing wave, but uh, that was kind of overlapped. <laughs> with the development of Bose-Einstein condensation, quantum degenerate gases, which are super macroscopic um, wave phenomena as well. But here, including many, many atoms, which are very loosely interacting at very low temperatures between picocalvin and microcalvin, binding energies on the scale of nanoelectron volts, or so hardly at all compared to electron volts in covalent bounds. And because of that, in all these experiments, even though they can involve really many, many, many atoms and large areas, so to say, large coherence lengths, um, each individual atom acts for itself. And what we're interested in and what the rest of the talk will be about is the extreme opposite regime, where we're interested in macromolecules, nanoparticles, which are extremely strongly bound, well, extremely just chemically bound with binding energies on the scale of electron volts, but also including atom numbers from a few 10, like in the fullerene here, 60, up to thousands in ongoing experiments, up to millions in experiments that we are setting up these days. And the temperature regime is also at the extreme opposite end, whereas before in Bose-Einstein condensation with ultra cold degenerate, quantum degenerate gases, people have been and are still looking into temperatures of equal to microkelvin, our molecules have internal temperatures ranging up to 1,000 Kelvin, where people would naively typically not expect any quantum phenomenon to prevail, just with the argument that this is so classical that this can couple so easily to the environment that this would be impossible. But I will show you how we can get around that. Because of the strong binding between all these atoms, um, the particle, the molecule, the nanoparticle, that really acts as one thing. And the entire molecule can be delocalized, can act as a wave. And um, what that really means, I will tell you in a second. So, but that's just the, the rough outline huh? and where we stand. Of course, historically, um, this is not the most straightforward trajectory. There are hundreds of groups working on both Einstein condensates. And currently, it's still our own group here in Vienna that's working with macromolecules waiting for others to join. Now. What does that really mean, wave phenomena with matter? And um, well, if Louis de Broglie was right, then it should, in principle, also apply to a soccer ball or football. 
But what would that mean for a soccer ball? And uh, we've just scaled up everything that you can do on the microscopic scale in quantum experiments to something that you can easily visualize. So here there's the brick wall with two gates, one closed, one open, and our little player um, shoots his ball through these gates, hits the goal, and there's a certain position distribution. And what well, you would already say, he's not the best player because it's broad distribution, but um, this has already some quantumness in it. It's so broad because of the narrowness of the open brick gate, so to say. But now the, the real thing that we're interested in, what is peculiar about quantum mechanics is the following. If you open the second gate, you know, if you make two slits in the wall, what happens to the distribution? Well, some people would say there's a number of new peaks coming up. But what is much more important is that, well, look at this. And when I open both, places that have been filled before are no longer hit by any ball at all. And that is a very peculiar thing. So you can imagine a ball being sent onto this brick wall one by one. How should this ball know whether the second gate is open or not? It can only fly through one, you would say. And if it does so, how should it not fill the spaces that are now left open? Um, so how come that the, that the ball knows about locations that it cannot probe as a classical object? Well, the answer is it's not a classical object. It's a quantum object. It's a quantum wave, uh, as described by Schrodinger's wave equation. And Erwin Schrodinger, one of the most famous um, Austrian physicists, actually was inspired by Louis de Broglie's idea and wrote up his wave equation, and um, that essentially describes what we see. And like with the water waves before, you see the, a very similar interference pattern. Now here is a distribution function for the probability to find walls in the goal. Of course, with a microscopic 20 centimeter or so FIFA ball, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it. Actually, when uh, my children were smaller, we tried it on the soccer field and uh, it didn't work. <laughs> and there are good reasons. And um, got good reasons for trying it on the soccer field and good reasons for, for it not to work. But um, the question is why? And then a number of very naive and, uh, and true reasons. And one of them is that the wavelength would be very small. Planck's constant is very small. It's um, six times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And if the mass is high and the velocity high, then the de Broglie wavelength can be very small. In some cases, like with a FIFA ball, it would even be smaller than Planck's constant, where even space-time may not be well defined. But uh, on a much, much smaller scale, things seem not to behave quantum mechanically. And so we're interested with my group in the question, what is the transition between quantum physics and macroscopic classical phenomena? It's one of the questions that we're pursuing. And um, we did that a long time ago. We, we started that long time ago, still with Anton Seiling in 99, um, really doing a copy of that experiment with the tiniest soccer ball that you can think of. And that is this thing here, a fullerene C60, which has exactly the shape of a FIFA ball with 12 pentagons, 20 hexagons, just um, enormously small. It's a nanometer in diameter. And if you send that through the experiment, um, you find this as a distribution of the fullerenes in your screen. Actually, it was a scanning laser beam. But you find what you expect, the distribution uh, interference patterns, as if the molecules were waves, delocalized waves, delocalized over several hundred times their own diameter. That was already kind of surprising, even though you could say it's just quantum mechanics. And uh, that, that's actually what happens to us uh, all the time, also in reviews of our papers. Some people say, well, that's kind of trivial. It's just quantum mechanics. And other people would say, this must be fraud. It cannot be true, because these are internally highly excited molecules. They change their shape. They're vibrating, rotating. How can they possibly interfere? And um, this decoupling between the internal and external degrees of freedom, that is something one also needs to understand. Now, <clears throat> in order to visualize this even better, where we did another experiment um, also eight years ago, 
And um, that was using the dye molecule thalassine. And well, you may wonder, what, what is the soccer play in reality? How can you launch such molecules? And in this case, we did it using laser light. Um, a blue diode laser was focused to a microscope objective onto a glass light, which was covered from the backside with these molecules, dye molecules. And that was the um, air vacuum interface and all the rest was in high vacuum. Now, the molecules were guided through collimating slits onto a grating, the double slit if you wish, which is shown here. This double slit is a nanomechanical grating from silicon nitrate with 100 nanometer period and 50 nanometer open slits. It's very tiny, but still uh, enormously bigger than the molecule itself, which is only 1.4 nanometers in diameter or so. Now, if the focus of the laser beam here is very, very tiny, then uh, actually a micron roughly, micrometer, then the, the spot is so well defined that Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, which relates an uncertainty in position with an uncertainty in momentum, this uncertainty relation would define that the transverse velocity of these molecules must spread out because of this very tight localization on the screen, on this um, source. So the molecule does not know in which direction it flies. Quantum mechanics forbids it to know in which direction it flies within certain bounds. And um, while it does that, it delocalizes its wave function, its coherence function, and it covers many of these slits at the same time. The wave function covers several of these slits, and the molecule acquires no one knows exactly how, the information about several of these openings and does as if it propagated as a wave through these slits. And we see that again by the appearance of the interference patterns that we'll show to you on the next slide. But before I do that, I want to emphasize that this is really single molecule interference experiment. We look at individual molecules, not like in water waves where you have 10 to the 20 or so at the same time, individual molecules. And you see that by by accumulating the molecules on the glass slide at the end of the vacuum chamber, illuminating this vacuum chamber, the, the glass slide with a laser, collecting the fluorescent light on a CCD camera, and then watching the molecules appear and disappear. Now, there are two such molecules sitting next to each other in a certain distance, a few microns or so, and um, you see them all with their um, diffraction limited point spread function, a few hundred nanometers, but which we can localize to within 10 nanometers. So we can tell for every individual molecule where it lands within 10 nanometers. And when you look at the time series here from top to bottom, you see that out of a sudden one of these molecules disappears. It doesn't bleach, it just disappears. And um, so that is kind of an indication that these are really individual molecules sitting there. Now, <clears throat> If you accumulate them after the grating, um, what you see is um, the following. And now all the movies don't work. And the question is why? We, we had it just a minute ago. Um, uh, bum, bum, bum. Maybe you allow me to share the screen once again, huh? Um, but do you see anything moving, Ono? No, uh, it doesn't seem to be moving. Yeah, that has something to do with a special presentation, but I will stop just for a second and, um, and reshare immediately. Yeah? Um, okay, so, and... Um, Okay, so you see that probably? Okay. Yes, now, now it seems to be working. Okay. Um, I have to switch off my sound, you don't hear the sound. Huh? Um, so the, the individual dots that you see, um, individual molecules arriving on the screen, on the, on the glass slide at the very end, and they appear to, to arrive at the screen randomly. Each individual molecule, you cannot tell in advance where it will land. But in total, if you look at all of them together, they will form a very nice interference pattern like you would expect it from uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, so you see both in the same picture, if you wish, um, the, 
particle nature because they really appear as discrete 10 nanometer localized bodies at the end. And you see the wave nature because of the interference pattern. And uh, we've done this in various different um, yeah, forms and modifications. It's always the same thing, quantum mechanics holds. In spite of the fact that the molecules can rotate, vibrate, and they do this at very high speeds. They rotate at 10 to the 10 times per second. Now, <clears throat> The question is, how far can we stretch that? And that is why we are working on what I call universal metawave interferometers. The question is, can we still take it to a protein, to DNA, to a virus, um, to a little mouse? Can we interfere only in the end? And well, the answer is for students and postdocs and professors, it will not work uh, for various reasons. But um, there's good reasons to believe that a virus is still within uh, a near future range. And so why should we do quantum optics with nano, massive nanoparticles at all? And um, on the one hand, there's a kind of philosophical and a techno technological challenge um, just to prepare non, not classical, but classical states of mesoscopic systems to see this interface between quantum and classical physics, maybe to search for mass dependent new physics. Um, there are some ideas how to test for dark matter and other things collapse of the wave function. And once you prepare these systems, you find that they are also useful for metrology. Not yet with the sensitivity that atom interferometry reaches, but um, meta-wave interferometers are very good acceleration sensors. And um, if these bodies have internal structure and can rotate, they can also be torque and rotation sensors. Now, <clears throat> Instead of this relatively straightforward textbook example of how to make wave interference visible, um, for high mass things, we have to, to use a trick because the, there's no laser for molecules. There's no coherent source for molecules to, to make them behave as waves. That is the tricky part. The source is the tricky part. And I'll show you in a minute how, how we do that regularly nowadays. So there we have our source. That can be in the simplest of all cases, just an oven where we evaporate vitamins, fullerenes, uh, tripeptides, whatever. And, uh, but they come out of the oven with a maximum Boltzmann thermal distribution. They're internally hot, they're externally hot. They do not want to behave as a wave. So you have to force them to do that. And this grating, the first grating is doing this. Um, I'll stop that here for a second. And um, so that grating here is, is a nanostructured nanomaterial grating, 266 nanometer period and only 110 nanometer slit widths. And the slit is so small that when a molecule hits this slit, each individual slit, um, it is kind of diffracted like a water wave would be diffracted at, a, at an aperture also. It generates little Huygens wavelets, if you wish. It's like dropping a stone in a water pond that makes circles, circular waves. Here, dropping the molecule into this emptiness <laughs> makes a kind of circular wave, a circular de Broglie wave, a quantum wave. And that spreads out to the second grating. And this second grating is special um, because this second grating, oops, now it's not moving. Oh yeah, here it is, is a, is a laser light grating, a standing light wave again with 266 nanometer period. And <clears throat> so what does that do? Um, let's stop it again for a second. So this standing light rate in the middle um, modulates the electric field of the laser every fraction of a, of a micrometer. And so there's a lot of light, less light, a lot of light, less light. And when a particle flies through, it is polarized by the light field. So the electron ion distribution is changed. And it's, it's like having a small um, dipole moment vector on the dipole moment vector on it. And um, so this dipole can interact with the field itself. And uh, because of that, gain some energy. And this periodic acceleration and deceleration that Defaces the incident matter wave and makes that a fringe pattern will appear at the location of G3, the grating that we see behind. And um, so I'll scan that through. Now, this is kind of the artist's illustration again. Huh? So the source emits some individual particles um, that transform into kind of waves that are diffracted by the optical grating and the density pattern of the molecules at the location of the third grating. That is what we, what we scan, what we test, what we probe, and that is the interference pattern that proves the quantum nature of these molecules. 
what is transmitted behind the thread creating, that is collected by a detector. In this case, it's a quadruple mass spectrometer, um, but it can be other detectors as well. Typical phenomena that we then observe are these interference fringes, which are, well, usually in these cases, sinusoidal. And the amplitude, the, the fringe modulation, that is the visibility, that is the signature of the quantumness of, of these interference patterns. Now, <clears throat> we've done this um, oops, for a number of um, different molecules, and I will just skip a few years ahead in time um, to the last three years, more or less where we started setting up a new experiment, which built on that idea that I showed to you before, and just stretched it by, by a factor of 10 compared to what we had before. We call this the long baseline universal metawave interferometer, long baseline because the machine is five meters long, the, the interferometer itself is only two meters, but um, it's long for our purposes and it's universal because it can manipulate a large variety of different particles, as you will see. It's not specific to one atom or one isotope of an atom, but it can have atoms, molecules, a large number of different things. And so you have a look into the machine on the right hand side, it's a huge vacuum chamber. Uh, so there's really hard work, mechanical work to be done if you set this up. And uh, that's also true for the central bar here, which is a 160 kilogram invar bar to make everything stable, suspended from a multi pendulum. And um, on top of that, there's um, nanomotors, very costly nanomotors uh, that uh, can adjust and roll and align and position everything within nanometers and uh, a few nanoradians. And that is kind of important to align everything very properly. The vacuum base pressure is um, 12 orders of magnitude below um, atmospheric pressure. And um, this instrument can handle de Broglie waves that are as tiny as 50 femtometers. Just to put that in perspective, the molecules that we send through are typically five, the biggest ones at the moment are five nanometers. So the wavelength that is related to, uh, to all the quantum phenomena that we're interested in is 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of the molecule. And yet the molecule is delocalized by again 50 times its own diameter. So it's there's a range of factor 5 million between the De Broglie wavelength and the delocalization it really does in the end. And <clears throat> so this makes a very exquisite force instrument for sensors, as you will see uh, a bit later. Now, we've subjected a number of different things to this interferometer. And um, well, that's just a technical detail to look into the interferometer, but the things that we through already onto this machine is atoms like uh, alkali atoms, alkaline earth atoms, cesium, barium, strontium, molecules from fullerenes to other organic um, uh, molecules like anthracene, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, tripeptides like alanine, tryptophan alanine, and the molecule which we love because it's the most massive that anyone has ever seen in such interference so far, uh, which is a functionalized oligoporphyrin, as you will see. So it's really a universal machine and um, that adapts to a variety of different particles that you can think of in nanotechnology, in biology, in chemistry, in atomic physics. And um, so that is our friend, the perfluoroalkyl functionalized oligoporphyrin. Actually, it doesn't have a proper name better than that because it just exists because we exist. This molecule has been synthesized by colleagues, by Marcel Mayer, uh, and friends, um, Patrick Zick and Marcel Meyer in Basel. And it has been synthesized in a few hundred milligrams amount and was evaporated and burned and brought into an interference experiment. And it is a very specific molecule because it has so many fluorine atoms. The high fluorine content makes that they do not stick to each other. It's like coating it with a Teflon shell, if you wish. It's not exactly that, but similar. And um, so it's relatively easy, still complicated, but still relatively easy to bring them into the gas phase, to make them fly. And it's an entire family of different molecules. It's a, it's a mixture of billions of different structures of molecules between masses of 25,000 to 28,000 mass units. So in each of these molecules, there are about 
1,800 up to 2,000 atoms with up to 6,000 vibrational modes per molecule. So many, many modes of how it can behave, how it can interact with itself. These molecules fly at the speed of an airliner at 300 meters per second. So they're really fast, have a diameter of five nanometers, 50 angstroms, and therefore, because of their mass and velocity, they have a de Broglie wavelength of the order of 50 femtometers. So it's a very extreme case. They're internally hot, a few hundred Kelvin hot, and they're extremely fast. They're extremely diverse. There's a huge, there's a plethora of different but similar in de Broglie wavelength particles, and each individual one of them interferes with itself and adds up constructively to a very similar interference pattern. And that is why we see nice sinusoidal fringes in this experiment, and um, we're happy to see that. Now, of course, you could say, well, if you have two gratings, one after the other, even a classical, so if you look through your fingers, um, you also see patterns, and that has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. How can you make sure this is really a quantum pattern? Now, in order to make sure that this is true, we had to vary a number of parameters, and here it's shown as a function of laser power. So what laser is that? That's the central laser um, that does this diffractive grating, 266 nanometers, where we can vary the interaction between the molecule and the laser light by changing the laser power. We change the phase shift the laser imprints on the molecule while it's flying as a delocalized object, as a delocalized wave through several of these nodes and antinodes of the laser wave. And that modulates the fringe visibility at the end. And we can compute that very accurately, and we can compare it with the experiment. And the black circles are the experiment, the blue line, the quantum model um, within the confidence interval. And the red line is the classical phase space evolution. And you can see it's clearly non-classical, far beyond the red curve, and it's well described by quantum mechanics. And that is kind of surprising. Even to me, it is kind of surprising because this thing really is highly agitated inside. It has so many vibrational modes that it's not unlikely that it will emit a few infrared photons, but typically at a wavelength much too long to give which part information and still not destroying interference. But um, so what can we learn from that? Um, on the one hand, there have been proposals out there asking, so why is it that quantum mechanics works in the classical, in, in the microscopic regime? And why don't we see these funny superpositions that things seem to appear at the same time in several places? Why, why don't we see that in our everyday world? And one of the explanations that an Italian team brought up was that, well, maybe we have to modify Schrodinger's equation. Um, maybe we have to modify the fundamental rules of quantum mechanics and add something um, you don't have to worry about the details here, but just add something, a term to the evolution that will break this superposition, that will make essentially what is sketched here at the bottom, that an extended wave function will collapse to a smaller wave function. Then it would look for us as if everything was classical, even if it's not. Um, now, this is uh, a valid theory in the sense that you can test and uh, falsify it experimentally. It hasn't yet been fully falsified, but it's at least one that one can test, and where one can test certain parameters, how small it would collapse, how often it would collapse, how many times per second. And the good thing is, and that's why our experiments are well suited for testing this, this phenomenon, if that, if that were true, would scale with the mass squared. So it would collapse all the faster, the the more massive this macroscopic superposition is. And <clears throat> so without um, looking into the mathematical details here, the short message is there's a certain parameter range of how fast it can collapse, that's a collapse rate lambda, and to how small a wave packet can it collapse, that's this radius of the collapse r. And you can test this um, using interference experiments as we do it, you can test it with heating experiments, that's a separate story. Um, that, that's not what I'm showing here. Um, and we're currently setting new bounds um, on these collapse models using quantum interference experiments in our LUMI, our uh, long baseline universal matter wave interferometer, and yeah, touching on excluding the, the most um, yeah, 
most prominent parameters here, proposed by Stephen Adler. <clears throat> There's still a way to go, and we still have to increase the mass, go to higher mass and longer delocalization times, and uh, I'll discuss in a minute how to do that. But um, we're already proud that there are no bound, new bounds. Well, there's also a philosophical question. Um, you can ask yourself, is what we're doing here a Schrödinger cat? Well, in order to answer that, we first have to see what a cat is. Huh? Uh, you, you know that's um, Wikipedia's um, design of a Schrödinger cat, um, illustrating what Evan Schrödinger suggested as a curiosity to test or to illustrate how, how strange quantum mechanics really is. So his apparatus was the following. There was a radioactive isotope uh, encased in this, in this box, and that could decay or not decay in a certain amount of time. If it decayed, it would release the mechanism which would drop the hammer onto this file or flask, and that would shatter and release a poison that would kill the cat. So if the radioactive isotope decayed, the cat would be dead. If, it's, uh, if the radioactive isotope has not decayed, the cat would be alive. And since this quantum optic, the radioactive isotope, can really be in a superposition, it's a microscopic quantum thing, it can be in a superposition of decayed and not decayed, so one would think that also the cat would be in a superposition of dead and alive. Well, do you need such a complicated mechanism to produce a macroscopic superposition? Certainly not, but it's, it was one um, that Schrödinger invented to show two different things, entanglement on the one hand, um, quantum correlation between a microscopic thing and a macroscopic, and on the other hand, just the superposition of something very macroscopic. And in that sense, well, a Schrödinger cat is for me something complex and macroscopic in two different clearly distinct states. Well, I should say that it should also be warm, but because that's distinguishing our experiments from others, and it should have at least one biologically relevant molecule in it, otherwise it's not a cat. <laughs> Um, and actually, what we have is porphyrins, and porphyrins are also part of hemoglobin. Um, porphyrins coated with a number of other things. And um, in superpositions, they are clearly distinct. And there are very many atoms, 2,000 at the moment. They're very hot, actually hotter than a living cat would ever be, 600 degrees Celsius. A real cat would be dead by then. And they're in a superposition of here and there, instead of dead and alive. So in that sense, it is a Schrödinger cat. It does not have in it the story of entanglement. Only indirectly, in decoherence experiments, we also see entanglement, but not useful entanglement. So that's kind of the philosophical part. And of course, it's interesting to see how far we can go. Can we really go to the cat? Cat, probably not yet. But can we go to other biological nanometer? If it's not the cat, what other nanometer in biology can we use? And we tried a number of different things already. Actually, the particle that I showed to you before that is in perfect quantum superposition is this functionalized oligoporphyrin. That has a mass very much comparable to what people in biology love, green fluorescent proteins. It's really the same ballpark. The number of atoms is a bit different because proteins typically have more hydrogen than fluorine, but the mass is really the same. So why not just interfere a green fluorescent protein? This has many, many technical issues, um, and uh, I'll come to that in a second. But we had already a number of different uh, biomolecules in our interferometers. Um, and why should we do that in the first place? And again, it's a philosophical question. Just the question, can we do it? Can we repair vitamins, peptides, proteins, viroids, whatever, in quantum superposition states? No one has done it. Can we do it? Would that in any way change the biological function? That's a kind of philosophical second order question. Um, would such Schrödinger cat states um, survive and can we have a biomimetic environment? Can we coat these, these uh, biomolecules with water and make them think, in quotation, to be in, in the natural environment? And it turns out that um, well, biology is nanotechnology because the biomolecules are very well defined. They come atomically defined, and it's in a certain sense easier, in another sense it's harder to prepare beams of biomolecules. They come mass selected. But they may have other channels to couple to the environment. They have typically huge dipole moments. They have motionless states that you wouldn't find in a metal cluster. 
So it's interesting also from a fundamental perspective to study the coherence. But um, again, as before, there's always, once you build such instruments, you can also use them to measure something for metrology. And what, what our instruments are specialized in compared to atom interferometry, which are rather looking into inertial forces like gravity and rotation, we're looking into the properties of the particles that are interfering. Uh, we're measuring the electronic, optical, magnetic, structural properties. Um, and there's so many of them that I won't read them here. But um, it's, it's interesting to look into the molecules by delocalizing them. And we've done this with small things like neurostimulants, antibiotics, vitamins, um, things that make you happy, things that may cure a bacterial infection, um, vitamins, a number of them, and provitamins. And in various different experiments, they all showed nice interference. Um, so it's certainly quantum interference is, is nothing sp specific uh, and peculiar to a certain atom or electron or neutron. It kind of applies to everything. And that's why we also call it universal. It, we've, we've seen it for so many different molecules. Um, and, um, but these are small molecules. And I'll come to a big, bigger biomolecule in a minute. But how can you measure internal properties of these molecules? And the idea is using the same machine as before. But now you send in molecules with different properties. So here they come as little blue, blue sticks and orange sticks. They delocalize, they interfere, they form their patterns. Uh, fringe patterns can be scanned and detected. So you find these different fringe patterns. And then, well, you can apply phase shifts. You can talk, let, let them talk to the environment. Once you have the, the fringe pattern accumulated, um, change something in the setting and do it again. And here in this particular case, oops, uh, that went a bit fast. Uh, you can apply an external field, an external electric field, oops, from the outside. Um, that is not so relevant. This is more relevant. And there's a shift of the interference pattern in this particular case that is proportional to the polarizability. So it's response to the electric field, uh, to the polarizability or the dipole moment that is generated by vibrations in the molecule. So the funny thing is, even though we're looking at, at the Broglie waves, which in the definition of before were just Planck's constant divided by mass and velocity, so the, the only property in there was the mass nominally. Still, we can retrieve all the internal, not most of the internal properties, electronic structure, geometry, and some of the vibrational activity by looking at the fringe shifts of the interference pattern. <clears throat> and um, so we use that for analytics, if you wish. And we've done this, again, for a number of different molecules here for vitamin E, alpha tocopherol, um, where the fringe shifts um, grow quadratically in the applied voltage. And from that, we learn about their uh, susceptibilities, for instance. Um, but there are many technical details that I don't want to emphasize here in that type kind of talk. Um, probably the most versatile application is to use it for spectroscopy, which we have only started. Um, which is interesting in the sense because it is minimally invasive, as I call it. Um, it, it operates on the single photon recoil on a single molecule and even a fraction of a single photon. Even the, on average, a tenth of a photon is enough to measure the absorption cross-section. Um, and the idea is, as before, you delocalize the molecules, get your fringe interference pattern, and then send a laser from the site. And if the photon, the light quantum from this laser is absorbed, the mechanical back action, the small, small recoil of the single photon will be enough to shift the interference pattern. And um, some of the molecules will absorb, some will not. Um, so you get a mixture of fringes shifted and unshifted. And it's sufficient if only a tenth of them is shifted so that you get a very sensitive um, measurement. And the interesting thing is compared to classical absorption measurements where you would prepare a thick sample and look for the light that goes through and hope that you attenuate the light to say one over E. Um, here, you don't need to, to attenuate the light at all. Um, the beam is extremely dilute. The molecular beam is extremely dilute. It's only the mechanical back action of the light that shifts the quantum interference. And in a classical absorption cell experiment, 
the same thing would need a million kilometer absorption cell. So it's a very sensitive probe. And um, yeah, it's, it's measuring absolute, so real cross sections, not relative ones. Now, just to show that we can extend that to larger things, um, we've also started looking into polypeptides, like this antibiotic chromicidine, which is a 15 amino acid um, polypeptide. The sequence shown here, you don't have to memorize that, it's only to show that we also look into the details. But the question is, how can you, how can you possibly bring a protein or polypeptide into the gas phase? You may have tried that at home uh, when you fry your egg. Huh? Uh, when you put water in your pan and make it hot, the water evaporates. When you put an egg in your pan, the egg does not evaporate. The egg denatures and sticks to the bottom. So that's certainly not what we want. Uh, we need the polypeptides flying in free flight through vacuum. And we tried many, many different methods over the time. And what turns out to be the most successful right now is to use ultra intense light, terawatts per square centimeter, 10 to the 12 watts per square centimeter uh, of laser light, but only in 300 femtoseconds. But you really have to think about it. It's about 1,000 nuclear power plants huh? um, at the same time per square centimeter in just a fraction of a picosecond. And you would think that this destroys the, the peptide, but it does not. Or maybe it does a few, but um, there are many, many intact going in, uh, into the gas phase. And then they're entrained in a supersonic jet of helium, or argon in this case, and um, they're cooled by, this, by the collisions with the gas and form a molecular beam. And this molecular beam can again be exposed to our interference machine. Here it's a different interference machine, um, which works with three light gratings. But the concept is exactly the same as before. There's one light grating, which is a pulsed grating that prepares the coherence, that makes out of these particles little Huygens wavelets, if you wish, little spherical wavelets. Um, by selecting them, only those that go through the nodes here can be transmitted. In the antinodes, they will be ionized and lost. And those that make it through the first grating, they look like Huygens wavelets, if you wish. Huh? And they fan out and cover the second grating. And again, in the, in the nodes, they cannot be transmitted. They will be ionized and extracted. In the antinodes, they can be transmitted and go on to the third grating. And at that grating, they again form a density pattern and an interference pattern, and that can be probed by the third grating. And these are extremely tiny gratings of only 18 nanometer period, because the light that we use is the shortest laser that you can commercially get. It's a fluorine laser of 157 nanometers. Now, also to demonstrate what happens to those who hit the nodes, they are ionized and just deflected. And if you play this trick, um, then you can again see the interference of, in this case, these antibiotic polypeptides. Um, and you see that, well, by scanning the time in this case, instead of space, that's a technical detail, but you see again fringe patterns coming up and uh, to understand them in full takes a little while, but um, believe us that um, the black dots here are the experiments and the blue dashed curve is the quantum to the full quantum model. And the green dotted curve is what you would expect without quantum mechanics in, in a classical model. And so again, even these polypeptides, um, relatively big uh, biological objects, um, show quantum interference and behave as delocalized quantum objects. So that is kind of the state of the art right now. And the question is, how does that project into the future? How, how does that go on? On the one hand, um, to go to higher and higher masses, um, there's two different routes, metal clusters and dielectric nanoparticles. Metal clusters, because it's so easy to make them. Um, you can make them in cluster aggregation sources uh, as ions, positive, negative, neutral. You can mass select them, cryogenically cool them in a buffer gas, neutralize them with lasers, and then subject them again to very similar gratings, optical photoionization gratings. So that's the plan for the next 
two or three years. That will probably get us, the hope is, to at least beyond 100,000 mass units, maybe half a million. <clears throat> and then gravity will start to come into play. Which is why we need to work again on other sources and um, maybe fountain schemes. And so why a fountain scheme? Because we need long interaction times. The wave functions need to delocalize, that requires time. And a typical time for all these schemes, um, at least with grating diffraction beam splitters, will be of the order, you know, or the, the typical length will be of the order of period of the grating square divided by the de Broglie wavelength. And well, without doing the mathematics here in detail, you can easily show that in principle, a million mass unit object, if you cool it to temperatures that we can easily reach to 10 Kelvin or so, will have a de Broglie wavelength of a picometer, which is 20 times bigger than what we're operating with right now. So that should be well in reach. If you want to extrapolate that to the size of a bacterium, 10 to the 10 mass units, <clears throat> um, well, that was 300 nanometer silicon particle or so. Um, that at this temperature would still be 15 femtometer, so very close to what we're working with right now anyway. So you would think, well, that's easy. But um, we hope it will be easy, but it will be a little bit hard. It will be hard because it's not only length, it's also time. The wave function needs time to evolve. And well, for a 10 to the 7 mass unit particle, this needs roughly 300 milliseconds, the typical gratings that you can do. For 10 to the 8, 3 seconds, 10 to the 10, 300 seconds. Now, 300 seconds in free fall, that is a deep, deep drop. 3 seconds, that still can be done more or less in the lab fountain. And that is one of the motivations to build a lab fountain. There may be other schemes as well. And uh, either, either case, either way, you, you need to, to cool these things to very low temperatures and um, to, to keep them in the experiment, to prepare them in the states that you need. And so I have to come to a conclusion. This is just to, to say, we've been working on various sources for cooling. Um, in Vienna, the University of Vienna, Markus Aspermeyer is pushing this also very strongly. And um, their joint interests also with UNO probably and other groups in Austria and in the world in general. And um, we're currently looking in microcavity cooling. Um, I think I will skip that and for the, for the discussion session because I'm a bit out of time already. Um, just to, to say there's, there's progress. Uh, in particular, in the fabrication of micro cavities that we think we will profit from for cooling particles in the range of 10 to the 7 mass units, two temperatures that we will need um, to get to these states to prepare these fountain experiments. It's one of the many options that we have to go for these fountains. So, with that <clears throat> um, short summary. So we call what we're doing universal matter wave interferometry because it should really expose all these different things to quantum superposition experiments, atoms, tailored micromolecules, biomolecules, clusters of atoms and molecules, dielectric nanoparticles, um, students, not yet. And the applications of that are very diverse, as, as diverse as the, as the particles are, um, they are kind of quantum biological questions that you may address with cryptochrome, which is a protein lower in mass than 100,000 mass units, where you would want to do a single photon spectroscopy and study the radical pair magnetism, photoisomerization, and things like that. Um, the clusters, metal clusters, are interesting to test the foundations of quantum mechanics, collapse of the wave function, start to demonstrate some, some dark matter test ideas. Um, I'm still confident that we can get the technology to get the viroids to interfere. Well, many people even don't know what a viroid is. It's not a virus, it's uh, smaller than that. But they're in a mass range that we can certainly address in the future. And, and there's yeah, nanoparticles that would really push to the mass limits to higher and higher masses for inertial sensing foundations tests and dark matter tests. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention, open for questions in whatever form they come now.
Thank you very much, Marcus. I'll clap for everyone's sake. Um, so at the beginning, I forgot to tell you, uh, we saved the questions for the end. Now is the time to ask questions. So, and I think everyone got that right. So, um, so I, I, I will read some of the questions that are coming to Marcus. And Thomas Ausinger asks, do these experiments, uh, high mass superposition, say anything about quantum gravity? Why, why not? Quantum gravity, not yet. Nothing that we are doing right now yet. Um, it's, well, that's, that, that's a very broad question because the answer to that, um, there, there are many different answers. So there are many, there's a number of theories that have proposed different routes to classicality through gravity in quantum mechanics, for instance. Um, and I can, well, actually briefly just, just mention some of them here. Accidentally, that's really the next slide. <laughs> um, so there's general relativity, quantum gravity, beyond standard model, and nonlinear quantum mechanics on that list. People said, well, that's more classical gravity, that gravitational waves might deface our interferometers. It turns out not the high mass experiments, maybe the extreme opposite, maybe super fast hydrogen experiments. Um, Chasla Bruckner's group has proposed that um, general relativity might deface these high mass interference experiments because of the many vibrational states inside, you have many clocks. And these clocks could get out of phase if, if you tilt the interferometer ever so slightly and, and get um, the upper branch and the lower branch differently redshifted. So that's not quantum gravity, it's classical gravity, which would induce dephasing. And that is certainly an effect that must be there, but it's too, too small for us to see. There may be violations of the weak equivalence principle, and it's not entirely clear uh, that there are kind of quantum gravitational reasons for that and others. And uh, no one knows exactly what, of course, you need to push the limits and to, to test different bodies, different, different, differently composed bodies for their free fall in, in gravity. Well, where we may contribute a little bit is um, that we can really compare the, the vastest differences from supermassive to atomic with internal delocalized angular momenta instead of only nuclear spin and things like that. There have been proposals also, even that we should be able to see something now uh, that turned out to be not correct, but um, uh, that space-time fluctuations might modify the interference pattern. The idea being that if the molecules are delocalized in space and if space-time fluctuates on the Planck scale, that there might be a remnant of kind of Brownian motion remnant of this motion on top um, of this Planck scale motion, um, but it's, it's way too small. And uh, a few years ago, they, they said one should be able to see that already at 1,000 mass units. Now they say 10 to the 10. Um, there may be... Yeah, dark energy, dark matter things, dark matter because it induces decoherence. And well, Penrose once proposed that, um, that gravity would be the agent that collapses the wave function. If that were true, uh, again, there's no clear reason why that should be. Um, there are some motivations that, that a particle in superposition of being here and there um, deforms space-time around itself, then you generate a superposition of space-times, and that should generate some non-linearities in quantum mechanics. That is kind of something that I can naively follow, but um, there's no very hard prediction. And But if there's any, then by Dioshi and Penrose, and that would go in the direction of 10 to the 10. And last but not least, um, there have been proposals also by... Um, Maletto and Vidral, and also by Bose and a number of colleagues, where they said if you can generate a superposition of two different high mass objects and get them close to each other, then gravity should entangle the quantum states. That would be a test. But it's all long time in the future. There's a lot of experimental technique to be developed for all of that still. Okay, thank you very much. So I would like to squeeze in a question. Uh, or let, let, let me, uh, 
ask one more question from the list, then I'll ask it, my question. Um, Artem Volisnev asks, what is included in the fully quantum model used to validate the quantum mechanical nature of the results? It seems impossible to consider all vibrational states of the molecule. Oh, yes, that is absolutely true. Um, and the good thing is we don't need to. So it is, the, the full quantum model is a center of mass model. That's also true in the comparison with the classical model is only a center of mass model. Um, the only part that we, that we include from the internal states is a scalar property, and that is the, um, the polarizability. The argument being that um, there are vibration states, as many as I mentioned, and as a very intense dynamics, but this is very fast on the transit time through, through the grating, so that essentially averages out. And um, on the other hand, we also would have to include the internal states if they coupled to the environment in a dissipative way, which they don't yet. In earlier experiments with fullerenes many years ago, where we heated them really to very, very high temperatures, we started seeing that this coupling to the environment destroys the interference better. And you can model that too, but here it was not necessary. So it's... Um, <clears throat> It's a, it's a decoupling of scale, so to say, that helps us in describing that. Okay, so my question is, um, so what is, uh, what are the perhaps different technical challenges associated with the, the, cl the, the metallic clusters? How is it different than the, the usual molecule interference effects and perhaps why, why, why haven't you done that first? Because yeah. it's more math, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, actually, we started with a similar source already um, long, many years ago. Um, had a collaboration started with Bernd von Isendorf, who's one of the metal cluster experts, a cluster expert in Freiburg. And um, it turned out that the interferometer that where we wanted to use that um, that was extremely selective in terms of velocity. And uh, we had to throw away quite a number of particles. Um, now, yeah, the setting is different. It's a continuous interferometer. Um, the, the length scale is also adapted to these high masses. So we actually had to have the new interferometer first to hopefully use it now, the, the metric cluster source. But it's a very intense source. And there's, there's a huge number of particles coming out. Um, one of the disadvantages, if you wish, is that they come in a large variety of masses. It's a pro and a con at the same time. Um, but the acceptance of the Lumi interferometer is very broad. So we can use also a large range of these clusters. So we just hope to make better use than in the past. Um, there, there are a couple of questions. I'm going to group them into the same kind of question. Uh, probably hard to answer, but let me ask you again anyway. So basically the questions are saying, um, can you use these kind of experiments um, with proteins, for example, to tell something about their function, or can you, by using these techniques, um, build newer kind of phenomena or molecules? So more, more about functionality yeah. questions. Um, so functionality um, is of course typically in a wet environment of a protein, um, but what I would love to get to, and so we're, we're starting right now experiments to do spectroscopy on these polypeptides. It's just to learn about um, the electronic structure. Um, infrared spectroscopy would also give you some geometrical, um, geometrical answer. What you can certainly do, and that's also uh, where we're hiring a PhD student right now, is to look at um, photoactivated structural changes in first small molecules, later than big molecules, uh, to study photoisomerization in the gas phase. And um, of course, there are many, many important photoisomerization processes in life, just the vision, for instance, uh, in rhodopsin. Uh, of course, that is typically in a, in a humid environment, in, in an aqueous environment. Um, but it's interesting to study that in the, in the gas phase and to learn how to model that um, and to see what the influence of the water environment might be. 
Um, there we still need collaboration partners also from theoretical chemistry, and which we have some, and uh, but it's that's complicated to describe. Um, or for instance, in, in the cryptochrome uh, experiment, what I really would love to do is to see whether we can see the magnetism of this protein in the gas phase. You know, there's a story about um, the magneto orientation of migratory birds that, um, like the European robin, which cannot orient properly in, uh, in the presence of red light, but with blue light, it, it finds his way better. Um, so the question is, what is this photoactivated mag magnetosensor? And then there are many experiments in chemistry in a, um, in a wet environment with many, many molecules. But to do it on the single molecule level, maybe we can do that in our interferometer. Um, the, the reason behind the reasoning behind that would be that uh, if you send the protein through the interferometer, uh, you would see a, hopefully a certain print pattern. And if you excite it um, with the light to this um, photo excited uh, radical pair generation, then uh, it would go into a magnetically susceptible state, which would be deflected and change the fringe pattern. So the question is whether we can do experiments like that. Whether they really help the biologists, we have to see. <laughs> All right, so um, since we're going a little bit late in time, there are a few more questions, uh, but perhaps l let me ask you and maybe you can briefly comment on a few of them. Um, so Colin McLaren asks, can you do experiments that can tell you something about relativistic wave equations? Like, Can you reach high velocities and still do experiments? Um, best guess would be... Um, uh, Hydro, fast hydrogen diffractors at graphene. Um, we have a proposal out there which is now being pursued by Christian Brandt at, uh, in Ulm at the DLR. Um, that, but, but even there, this is not really relativistic, it's 100 kilometers per second. Huh? It's, it's still very uh, sub relativistic. But maybe one can see a small influence there. But um, yeah, for, for us, it's really low velocity for um, higher longer the broader wavelength at high mass. So it's um, difficult to get to these special relativistic velocities. Okay, is chirality important for these kind of matter wave interference experiments? Good question. And we've been thinking about that ever and ever again. Um, so there's a tiny effect, which is still too small. So if you take different the molecules of different chirality, uh, send them through our optical phase grating. The optical phase grating itself has chirality. It is helical. And, but the, um, the circular dichroism is typically such that the index of refraction difference is only on the per mil level for different, uh, different chiralities. If we could enhance that by an order of magnitude or so, then we would see that. Um, so we were thinking about sorting of chiral molecules and things like that, but um, it needs a even you know, hexahelicene, like which is a very staircase molecule, or so, uh, it's not yet chiral enough for that. Okay. So I'll I'll do one last question and we will wrap up here because it's getting late. So there's a question from Sebastian Wald saying, is it possible to prepare molecular number states for interference experiments? Uh, that sounds like uh, like a contradiction in per se, so to say, because if you prepare number states, then the phase should be gone. Uh, there's an uncertainty relation between uh, number and phase. But uh, otherwise, preparing molecules on demand, uh, just for whatever purpose, um, um, we've been thinking about that many, many times. And uh, heralded, I think we can do at some point, also nanoparticles, hopefully soon. But um, really, Fox states in the proper sense, it's, it's difficult. And But if you prepare Fox state, then yeah, the, the phase issue, the phase number uncertainty is something we should discuss. Okay. All right, so um, since it's a bit late, we'll, we'll thank you very much. Uh, for everyone, I'll, I'll, I'll clap again. And um, so we'll, we'll conclude here. And it was great to have you, uh, not physically, unfortunately, but virtually. So we hope to see you sometime on, soon on the campus anyway. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Hope to see you soon in real life at IST. Huh?
Sounds great. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao.